Bishop James Pike was one of the most controversial and paradoxical clergymen of our century. He was a lawyer turned priest. A Roman Catholic turned Episcopalian. He drew thousands into the church, yet was almost thrown out as a heretic. Some called him genius. When he went to mediums and seances, however, they called him mad. At last, he faced his destiny alone in the wilderness. His personal quest was for the answer to man's oldest mystery. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. In September of 1969, after James Pike resigned as Bishop of the Episcopal Church, he drove into the desolation of the Israeli desert with his new wife, Diane. It was here in 1948, in the caves of Qumran, that the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. These parchments documented Hebrew law at the time of Jesus. Pike and his wife had come to explore these caves and experience the wilderness where Christ was tempted by Satan. Having followed an inaccurate map, they found themselves trapped in a riverbed far from the main road. They set out to seek help with only a bottle of soda and no protection from the 140 degree heat. The outspoken Pike had recently been banned from performing any priestly duties and had quit the church, hurt and angry. Was he here to retrace the steps of Christ or had he in some way known he might die? Even in his youth, Pike's life centered on the church. As a child, he drew religious figures and dressed paper dolls as priests. A pious teenager whom others called a loner, he attended Roman Catholic mass daily. He spent years doing special devotions to make sure that he would go to heaven. Priests took the place of the father he lost when he was two. With them, he shared doubts he was already having about his faith doubts that would always shadow him. His entire life was spent searching for meaning. As a youth, he left the Catholic Church and turned agnostic. After college, he began a promising legal career, but left it and became an Episcopal priest. It became a lifelong pattern. On the one hand, irresistibly drawn to the church, on the other, in conflict with it. Only five years out of divinity school, he was installed as dean of one of the largest cathedrals in the world, St. John the Divine in New York City. Pike brought new life to the vast cathedral and to the faith as well. He put traditional church theology into everyday language and used his powerful pulpit to voice his opinions on current issues his opinions began to irritate church hierarchy. When the movie Baby Doll was called pornographic by Catholic Cardinal Spellman, Pike boldly went to see for himself. His attendance made news, and his sermon the following Sunday declared the movie profoundly Christian in message and less sensual than DeMille's movie The Ten Commandments. While some called Pike a publicity hound, others, like Archdeacon Darby Betts, understood his motives. Bishop Pike had a great nose for news, and I am convinced that his chief seeking of fame, notoriety, public attention, anything else you want to describe, was of course partly due to ego, but primarily due to his determination to be a preacher, to be an evangelist. ABC television recognized his growing popularity and gave him his own weekly show. Now married for the second time, his wife and four children were often on the program. While he loved his family greatly, 
he had little time for them. He would later consider himself a failure as a father, partly perhaps because of his alcoholism, which took him years to conquer. Bishop Paul Moore of New York knew the driven clergyman for over 20 years. I think the first thing I'd say about Jim Pike as a person to meet for the first time was an enormous energy, intellectual energy, physical energy. It was very hard for him to sit still. When he was talking, he was always using his hands and his arms, and his mind was going a mile a minute and usually going faster than his words, so that you had a sense he was always trying to catch up with his thinking. Pike was so compelled to achieve that he didn't consider his workday over until nearly midnight. He authored 20 books, including one entitled The Next Day, which he had to compile in 24 hours to meet a forgotten deadline. He traveled in the Holy Land to examine the Palestinian problem. Panels, articles, crusades. He missed few opportunities to capture public attention, endangering his health and his marriage. Why was he never satisfied? What was he trying to prove to the world, to the church, or to himself? Some say Jim was a genius, and some say he was mad. Uh, I, I think that genius is very close to madness, and in Jim Pike's case, I think most of the time, genius was being expressed. But the madness did come through. The madness came through in lack of control, in, in going far beyond the limits of normal human endurance in his use of himself and his expectations of others. In 1958, Pike became Bishop of California, a position he had desperately wanted. The office had drawbacks, however. Now he would be expected to defend church orthodoxy, even if he disagreed with it, and disagree with it, he did. In tune with the rebellious spirit of the 60s, he seemed to voice the unspoken doubts of millions about such once unquestionable doctrine as the virginity of Mary and the deity of Christ. And not only did he challenge the church, but he became more and more politically outspoken. This sounds very unpatriotic, because the communist countries were on the side of God, whereas our nation was on the side of the devil, and it lost hooray. He marched in Selma with Martin Luther King and said that he was quite ready for mayhem and death. He protested the war in Vietnam and proudly displayed his new peace cross. He established a street ministry in San Francisco to fight prejudice and help runaways, dropouts, and gays. He embraced each new project with unbounded enthusiasm. When Pike added new stained glass windows to Grace Cathedral, he chose to honor not biblical figures, but scientist Albert Einstein and astronaut John Glenn, personal heroes whom he called secular saints. In many ways, Pike was as wide-eyed and unrestrained as the flower children who populated Haight-Ashbury. The remembrance of him, that means most to me, was his almost being a little boy as well as a great man. He was not only naive, he was not only humble, but he was starry-eyed about so many things. He was, he was so vulnerable. Though popular with the public, the ecclesiastical tide began to turn against Pike, and some in the House of Bishops whispering heresy sought ways to silence him. Bishop Moore, however, tried to help. And we'd get him aside and say, Jim, now you please don't put it this way because it's unnecessary. You're going to alienate everybody and make it tough to get this issue through. And then, you know, he'd go off and talk to reporters, and the headlines the next morning would be disastrous. And we'd grab him and pull him into the room, the smoke-filled room, sit him down, give him a drink, and say, now, wait a minute. You really lost everything up. Will you please behave yourself? for the rest of the session. And of course he never would, which was part of his genius, but it sometimes uh, drove some of us crazy. Serious problems now surrounded him, at home as well as in the church. His 20-year-old son Jimmy was taking LSD and seeing a psychoanalyst. Together, Pike and his son left for a sabbatical in England, 
where they caught up on years of their relationship. They talked about life and death. They developed a closeness the two had never known before. On their return to the United States, Jimmy stopped off in New York alone. He had said goodbye to his father in London. Near Times Square, Jimmy bought a rifle. The despondent note he left in his hotel room would give little reason why he took his life. Was his suicide the result of drugs, or was there another cause? The questions tormented Bishop Pike, even as he conducted his own son's funeral. As he followed Jimmy's wishes and scattered his ashes beyond the Golden Gate, Pike despaired that after finally learning to communicate with his son, the door was irreversibly closed. Or was it? In the years to come, he would defy the boundary of death itself, seeking contact with his son from beyond the grave. Tormented by feelings he had failed as a father, Bishop Pike returned to England to lose himself in his work. In the apartment he had shared with his son, odd events began occurring. Books were found on the floor at a peculiar angle to each other, as though arranged. Inside one book was a postcard his son had bought, stuck as though glued. Throughout the flat were found safety pins, opened so wide they must have been bent that way for some purpose. And there were more postcards lying at the same angle. A clue came when a broken clock whose hands had been stuck at 12.30 was discovered with the hands now stopped at 8.19. The clock hands, the postcards, the books and safety pins, all at the same angle. Bishop Pike calculated that 8.19 was close to the London time when his son died. Was Jimmy trying to communicate with him? Pike was not alone in the apartment. With him were David, his chaplain, and Merrin, his editorial assistant. All three were baffled by the strange events and could not agree on a natural explanation. The phenomena occurred so frequently that the bishop began to keep a log of anything that seemed unusual, searching for a pattern or meaning. One day, his closet was found with one part much neater than usual, and the other a total mess. The thermostat was found set uncomfortably high, the way Jimmy liked it. And the most startling incident, Pike and Marin watched as a hand mirror moved by itself. How many of the phenomena were as strange as he reported? And how many were the imagination of a grief-stricken father yearning for contact with his son? Bishop Pike wrote that often, in the midst of conversation, he would suddenly become aware of the time, always at 819. Some said his obsession bordered on madness. If Jimmy was trying to make contact, what was he trying to say? Perhaps a spiritual medium could provide the answer. Pike sought one to obtain, as he termed it, professional help. He's here, she said. He's trying very hard to get through. Ina Twig was a well-known English medium and a member of his church. As she focused her attention on something of Jimmy's, Pike sensed a change. Pike felt that Jimmy was speaking through the medium. His son described how he had moved objects in their apartment, regretted his suicide, and was glad, as he put it, about the Golden Gate. Pike held two sittings with Twig and was impressed. But could she have been told these facts and faked the communication? Did Merrin, who some suspected was unbalanced, create the phenomena and feed the information to Twig? hoping to give Pike reassurance that his son's spirit lived? Pike doubted it, but would seek other mediums in America. Upon his return to San Francisco, Pike realized, as he put it, that he was not twins and could no longer bear his personal strains and hold the office of bishop. 
Thousands attended his farewell sermon. If it does not seem that there ever is going to be a second coming, if there was not a virgin birth, if there is not a committee God, the Trinity, if there was no ascension into heaven, if there was no descent into hell, then what can a man believe? Pike would search for the rest of his life to answer that question. He continued active as bishop without an official position. While teaching a course in religion, he met a young woman who became his companion, administrative assistant, and a stabilizing influence, Diane Kennedy. Invited to join the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions in Santa Barbara as theologian in residence, he researched two of his favorite topics, the Dead Sea Scrolls and the life of the man Jesus. But his agitated life was far from settled. At the 1966 House of Bishops meeting, Pike would be called heretic, then censured. Well, in simplest terms, what rank of the House of Bishops is that he was basically a pest. He was a pest in that he constantly brought up subjects brilliantly that people would wish that he'd leave alone. His keen legal mind challenged the censure and demanded to face his accusers in a heresy trial. However, the law was changed and Pike was never tried. His professional career was saved just as his personal life fragmented further. In his Santa Barbara apartment, his assistant, Marin, committed suicide, apparently unhappy that Pike lacked romantic interest in her. The scandal was quickly buried. Shortly thereafter, his 25-year marriage to Esther ended in divorce, leaving him free to openly pursue his relationship with Diane. In September 1967, Pike made perhaps his most controversial news of all, attending a seance televised from Canada with the celebrated medium Arthur Ford. While Ford's voice was reassuring, there was little that proved they were really speaking with Jim. Jim says he wants you to definitely understand that you nor any other member of the family have any right to feel any sense of guilt or any, have any feeling that you failed them in any way. A few months later, they visited Ford again, sitting. Diane Pike. Um, the, the second one, the Philadelphia sitting, was, was very evidential. We went with specific questions that we wanted to ask to see if we could get detailed information about Jim Jr.'s death. Um, how it had taken place and what were the circumstances before the death and um, many details that we had not been able to find out any other way. Ford revealed that Jimmy committed suicide due to deep fears about his masculinity. The bishop acknowledged he knew of the fears, a private detail he believed to be unresearchable. After Pike and Diane wrote about the psychic experiences, they were married, sure that they had the tacit approval of the church. They were wrong. Just after the wedding, the next Bishop of California, perhaps pressured by the House of Bishops, banned Pike from performing any sacred duties. In essence, he was defrocked. Devastated by this final blow, the bishop and his wife quit the church. A trip to Israel was part of their plan to begin a new life of research and travel. Pike put his affairs in order before he left, even making visits to all his children. Um, we spent an entire night, but the night before going out into the desert, reviewing his life and talking about the parts of his life that he felt were still unfinished, of which there was really only one major one that, ha that was in relation to his wife of 25 years. Um, and uh, he wrote her a birthday note and mailed it, actually, just as we were leaving the hotel to go out into the desert. In the wilderness, they had planned to literally walk in Jesus' footsteps. Did Pike in some way feel he might never return? Lost in the desert, Pike grew weaker. They soon agreed Diane had the best chance of getting help and should go on alone. 
it would be their only hope of survival. For 10 hours, she struggled through deep ravines and up high cliffs, knowing that soon they would face the merciless sun, that neither could survive. The region was uninhabited, except for a small camp of Arab road workers. Near dawn, they heard what they thought was an animal, but soon recognized a woman's voice crying, Shalom. Diane was safe, but what about Jim? A few hours later, she led a search party to retrace their path. He was not where she had left him. Had he found his way out? Pike had discovered a small spring and pushed on, perhaps fearing Diane needed help. To show he'd been there, he left clothing behind. Ultimately, he was found, but not alive. He had fallen, and his body rested in a kneeling position. There are those who would say that perhaps, in the end, his faith had conquered his doubt. I suppose the historical role you would label someone like Jim as a prophet. What he was saying was said with such clarity and strength and sometimes abrasiveness that the church felt threatened. I think they couldn't accept him because they knew he was right so often. 